Well, good morning, Grace Bible Church. Welcome. We are so glad that you're here. Uh, there are lots of opportunities for you to worship in a lot of different places on the internet. And so we are just so grateful that you would join us this morning with us. We're really glad. Today, there is a special guest that's going to be teaching, and he's special to us. A lot of you probably know him, but Jim Tamesian is here with us teaching, one of the best Bible teachers around, and so I'm excited to hear from him, and I hope you are too. For our online audience, there is a way that you can connect with us. We have staff that are in those chats that want to talk with you. So let us know where you're watching from. Uh, maybe let us know who you are because our team, Betsy and her crew, they want to connect with you and get you involved. Speaking of connections, uh, we got a little gift basket here. Basket, this is a bag, and uh, it's got a coffee mug in it. And in fact, there's a little coupon for some coffee with a staff member because our staff would love to meet you. And so you can text this number that's on the screen, 805-413-4675, and our team will connect with you. So send us a text, let us know you're watching, and we want to connect and hang out with you and bring you into the body of Grace Bible Church. God is at work. He's doing some great things in the life of our church. We'll share a little bit about that here in a little bit, but we're going to sing some songs. So let me pray and invite you to prepare your hearts for some worship. Father, we stop and God, we give gratitude. In a season that's been difficult for many, we, we just stop and say thanks. God, thanks for the ways that you're working in individual lives and hearts. Gotta even remember back to the baptisms at the beach just a, a few weeks back. I'm grateful for hearts changed, for lives changed. And Father, we invite you this morning. God, with the confidence knowing that you're already here. God, open our hearts, open our minds to you. Teach us something, not just so we can be smarter, but God, that it would be transforming. I love you. I'm grateful for what you're doing in our church. We give this morning to you. Amen. stand before the Lord, kneel before the Lord, sing, invite him to do his work here. Let our praise be your will. Let our songs be a sign that we are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath from heaven and fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. We are here for you. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are one desire. shout be your anthem your renown fill the sky we are here for you we are here for you yes God. let your word move in power let what's dead We are here for you. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. We 
sing that again, sing it to God. You are hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. You are one desire. Your fire fall down. We welcome you here, God, to your work in our lives as we praise you. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. Let every heart adore, let every soul away. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. song this morning. Just sing along as you learn it with us. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now For I am safe with you Of course, so when I fight I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty of you, God. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing 
Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. great singing. You can have a seat wherever you find yourself this morning. The battle has been won and uh, victory is real. And I got the privilege to just kind of give you an update, uh, a ministry update. Grace Bible Church exists to empower movement of people to live in love like Jesus. And uh, we do that through inspiration, transformation, and action. And so as we've looked back at this fall, which has been very unique and different, and you've probably heard that a million times, you're sick of hearing that, um, but it's real. And everybody's got their own little stories, but we've seen some victories. We've seen some wins here at Grace Bible Church, and I just wanna share some with you. On Tuesdays, we've been doing a food distribution, uh, delivering over 120 boxes, 18 people a week, nine different locations, being in the hands and feet of Jesus, taking up action and serving. We've had approximately eight uh, new people show up, new family units to our church in this season, just in September alone. And if you are new and you're watching this, remember, text that number, hello, and we'll get you connected. Last weekend, we had a membership class with about 25 people go, yes, I'm ready to take the next step and become a member of Grace Bible Church and their discipleship process. Students has been regathering for a few weeks now. We've had over 60 students on Wednesday nights at an outdoor service. Uh, Galen, Emily, and Brennan and that team has been doing an incredible job just ministering to students. Online, this is a new world. We've seen about 500 approximately people viewing each week online this service. And so we're just so grateful for that. And maybe you're one of those that are viewing, but you haven't really stepped into a chat or you haven't really made the next step to engage with a staff member, I would encourage you to do that this week. We've had an outdoor service in the parking lot, a church in a box, teams of people showing up at 6.37 in the morning to set up, to tear down approximately 300 plus each week for our outdoor service. We're so grateful. Kids ministry is relaunched. About 20 first through fourth graders are showing up. This is just the first week in 1256ers. God is doing a work in the life of our church, and it's only possible because of you and your participation. And so we would invite you to continue to participate, whatever that means for you. Maybe it's membership, maybe it's baptism, maybe it's serving on a team, I don't know. Maybe it's just acknowledging that you're in the room in an online service. For some of you, it's stepping forward and giving for the first time. We're so thankful for the support most of you are giving online, some of you are dropping gifts by, but all of this ministry, all of these victories is only possible because of you. So as we, as we prepare our hearts to give, uh, let's give cheerfully, give gratefully. I wanna pray for the offering and the money's given and just thank God for the ministry that he's done just in September. This is just September alone. There's a bright future in front of us. Let me pray and we'll continue worship. Father, again, I stop and say thanks. 
God, it's good to just look back, get a glimpse of your victories. God, in the midst of hard seasons for a lot of people, you are victorious. God, we look to the future. God, we wanna see more people engaged. God, we wanna see more people take a deeper devotion towards you. God, I'm thankful for the folks that give so generously. God, and for the money that's given today, would you bless it, would you multiply it? God, would you give wisdom to how to steward it? God, we wanna see more kids, more students, more adults, more boxes. We wanna pray for more low-income folks. Father, we just commit this morning to you. Thank you for what you're doing. We pray these things in your name. Amen. It's easy uh, at times to feel like uh, you're isolated, you're alone, that no one else can imagine what it is that you're going through in your particular set of circumstances or the things that you deal with. And um, yeah, we're reminded time and time again throughout Scripture that, uh, you know, we're, we're more alike than we are different. And the person beside you and the person across the street is, is dealing with probably much similar things as a person, a human who has a heart like you. And it's so great. I love this song because it talks about when we come to Jesus that he's the difference maker. Our stories uh, all bring us to Jesus in, in a variety of different ways. But at the end of the day, we're saying the same thing. It was Jesus. It was Jesus. It changed my life. It's Jesus that continues to be the thing that the person that changes my life and my source of hope and my source of life and salvation. So as we sing this this morning, uh, let's remember that, that, that it, it's about Jesus. No matter where we're coming from, he's the one that, that does the work. Blessed assurance Jesus is mine What a foretaste, glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Sing that second verse with us. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture. Now burst on my side, angels descending, ring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. 
is in my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior. Happy and blessed Watching and waiting I'm looking above Filled with His goodness Lost in His love This is my story in my Savior all the day long all the day long all the day long so God this morning we gather in a variety of places Lord even some out of our country joining us this morning. And God, what a joy to know that you are present with us no matter where we are. God, that we are washed, washed by your blood. We're born of your spirit. And so Holy Spirit, we pray that you would open up the very eyes of our heart this morning that you would bring new illumination to our minds, transformation to our hearts and to our lives as we spend time in your word together this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I am... Glad you're joining Grace Bible Church online. My name is Jim Tamesian. I'm a member of Grace Bible Church. I'm not a pastor. Today we open God's word to one of the most intriguing sections in all of the Bible. Uh, here Jesus lays the, the foundation, the groundwork, uh, for a new unfolding of the most important person in the universe. God. The word prepare and foundation, those words um, are important for all of chapters 13 through 17. Theologians call these chapters the upper room discourse. Pastor Jason has been talking about the last five hours, the five hours the evening before the crucifixion. Last week, Pastor Jason presented a moving and informative message on verses 1 through 14 of chapter 14. Jesus tells his disciples he's going away, he's leaving, and he's going to prepare a place for them. They can't go with him. He says to them in those first few verses of chapter 14, I'm going to a Roman beam tomorrow to prepare a place for you so that you can be in me. Hitherto impossible because of separating sin. Jesus says tomorrow I'm going to make it possible. I'm preparing that place for you in me. GraceBibleChurch.com uh, Excuse me, GraceBibleAG.com Dot com. You'll be able to get that message from Jason. Uh, if you can watch it, you'll be blessed. As we consider the remainder of chapter 14, we must know the context 
of the passage so important when we examine scripture to know what is the context in what what surrounds the, the the statements in scripture what's the setting what's the condition of the recipients be they hearers or readers the bible was written for us but not to us so it's important to learn what the words meant to the person who read them or the person to whom they were spoken. Here, Jesus speaks to 11 disciples. Their world is changing. It's, it's a world that, that surrounded Jesus for three plus years. They left their professions to follow him. He was their purpose. And now he's leaving. Not only was he their purpose, he was their protector. Jesus was not popular with authorities at the time of his ministry, and so by association, nor were the disciples, but Jesus was the one who protected them. The 14th chapter of John opens with, with reassurance and, and even a, a command, if you will, let not your hearts be troubled. In, in our day, we would say, don't be distressed in your innermost being in the deepest recesses of your mind don't be anxious don't let your hearts be troubled jesus gives three foundations for that command or that reassurance the first one if you look at verse 1 of chapter 14 let not your hearts be troubled believe in god believe also in me the first foundation of that reassurance jesus says I'm God, and I'm telling you this. Don't be distressed inside, and it's coming from God. So that's the first foundation. The second foundation of that reassurance is seen in the next verse. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Tomorrow, on that cross, I'm preparing the place for you to be in me. That's the second foundation of that reassurance. The disciples will be in Jesus. Uh, which is in God. If you look ahead to verse 21, excuse me, verse 20, verse 21, verse 23, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Jesus is, is first of all, giving the disciples the promise that they'll be in him just as he's in the, in the Father. If you look ahead to verse 23, Jesus is answering Judas, not, not Iscariot. Lord, how is it that you'll manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him. And notice, and we, underline we, will come to him and make our home with him. Jesus is again telling the, the disciples, I'm God, I'm equal to the Father. Now a little background. The Jews had notions, they had prophecies from the Old Testament that Messiah was coming. They knew, Moses in Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter says, Messiah's coming, uh, he, he'll be a prophet like me, appointed by God, so they knew Messiah, by the way, Messiah is the Hebrew word for anointed one or deliverer. Uh, we use the word derived from the Latin Christus, which means the same, anointed one or deliverer. Christus, the Latin, we use Christ. So when we say Jesus Christ, we're saying Jesus Messiah. The Jews knew Messiah was coming, but here's an important feature in the context of what the disciples heard. They did not think he was God. They knew he would be a prophet, that he would be inspired by God, but the Jews did not believe Messiah would be God. They expected this Messiah to be a leader, uh, to be one who would bring them back to the glory days of King David, which were at this time about a thousand years prior, but not God. In fact, the rabbis went to what I would say great lengths to deny that, that Messiah would be God. If you recall from memory, in the ninth chapter of Isaiah, there's a prophecy that Messiah is coming as a son. Listen to the words of the prophecy, the ninth chapter of Isaiah. 
For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. Now go back. The rabbi said all of that is only a description of Father God. It's just another way of describing Father God. But, but to go back to those first phrases. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Is that just poetic repetition? I think not. Look at the words. Unto us a child is born. That's a natural born human being, born of a woman. A child born of a woman, human. But look at the next phrase. Unto us a son is given. Whoops. That's not human. That's divine. A son is given by God. I think you have in that phrase a picture of the humanity and the deity of Jesus. Unto us a child is born, his humanity. Unto us a son is given, his deity. Jesus repeated claims to be equal to the Father was incomprehensible to the Jews, to these disciples. They, they expected Messiah, but he was not going to be God. So the foundations of that reassurance, don't be troubled on the innermost part of you. First of all, the first foundation, I'm God and I'm telling you. The second foundation, I'm going tomorrow to prepare a place for you. The third foundation, and this was huge, difficult for the disciples to understand this in addition to all the other changes Jesus was telling them. This is a big change coming. Here it is. God will be in you. The Holy Spirit, every much God as I'm God, as the Father is God, that God will be inside of you. Let's look more closely at this last feature, preparing the disciples for God coming to live inside of them. Look, look at verse 15. If, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper to be with you forever. People do not naturally want to obey God. With, with this in mind, Look more closely at verse 15 because verse 15 tells us there's a connection, there's a link between loving Jesus and keeping his commandments or, or his words. Now, loving Jesus is not equal to obeying him. Loving precedes obedience. Loving motivates obedience. If we look at verse 15 here, there's that link between love and obedience. But if you move down to verse Verse 21 and verse 23 and, and verse, excuse me, verse 22 and 23, Jesus repeats that link three more times in these verses. He, he says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Again, as in verse 15, loving and keeping his commandments. Uh, in verse 22, uh, uh, excuse me, verse 23, if anyone loves me, again, he'll keep my commandments. And then in verse 24, it's put in the negative, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Love for Jesus, or, or love for anyone for that matter, doesn't come by imposing it on yourself. It, it doesn't work to say, uh, I'm commanding my will to love Jesus or to love anyone. You only know you, you, the only one way to, to love Jesus is, is to come to know and believe in his love for you. To know he gave up his life for your sin. To know that he loves you enough to discipline you, enough to direct you. That's the way we, we come to, to learn to know Jesus. Jesus will continue in this discourse to the disciples the presentation of really, really new information. He'll, he'll continue with the person and the work of the Holy Spirit more new ground for the disciples. In the Old Testament, the disciples knew that the Holy Spirit came upon people for specific tasks at specific times. Uh, the Holy Spirit was not in them in the Old Testament. When, when the Holy Spirit appears in the Old Testament, it's for a specific time. And the Holy Spirit was not with people permanently in the Old Testament. 
The Holy Spirit is God a person, not just a power. He's not a person with body and flesh, but he is a person with knowledge, with will, and with the ability to carry out tasks. The Holy Spirit is as much God as Jesus is God, as much God as the Father is God. If you, if you go forward to the book of Acts, in chapter 5, there's an interesting play on uh, discussion here on property. And there is a clear statement of the full deity of the Holy Spirit. If you look at Acts chapter 5, here's the scene. Ananias sells a piece of property. And he brings it to church, to, to Peter specifically, and he says to Peter, uh, I sold this property and I'm giving all of the proceeds from the sale to the church. Now Peter learns that's not the fact. He did sell the property, but he's keeping part of the profit and only giving part to the church. So Peter says to Ananias, in effect, you know, it would have been fine if you just kept the property. That would have been fine. Or if you sold the property and gave us part of the proceeds and told us here's part, that's fine. But you didn't do that. So look, look what Peter says. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? Now move down, move down to the end of the, of the section here. You've not lied to man, but to God. Oh, do you see it? The Holy Spirit, you lied to the Holy Spirit, and you lied to God. Peter is making a clear statement. The Holy Spirit is fully God in this account with Ananias. The important distinction for us is between the Holy Spirit we can control and the Holy Spirit of the Bible. God cannot be controlled. Jesus could not be controlled. People tried during that three-year ministry to control him unsuccessfully. Likewise, the Holy Spirit cannot be controlled by humans. Let's continue because Jesus will tell us more about the, the role and the work of the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, And I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper. I want you to underline another and helper. We'll look at both of those words. The English Standard Version translates the word here, helper. I don't care for that translation, helper. Now, I know when the translators of the Bible did their work from Greek to English, they didn't ask me my opinion on the translation. However, I still don't like the word helper. Why is that? Because helper connotes a subservient relationship to the one being helped. If you are a plumber's helper, you are one subservient to the plumber. That's why I don't care for the word helper in this translation. The actual Greek word is parakletos. Now the true root words of that word, para, means alongside of. So you have parachurch organizations that come alongside the church in the ministry, or you have a paralegal, one who comes alongside of an attorney in the work. So para coming alongside and kalian called out. So the parakletos, translated helper here, is one who's called alongside to help. Some Bibles translate this word counselor, and I, I think that's probably closest to the original Greek or advocate. Um, some translate the word comforter here, and that's okay as long as you don't think of a silky quilt to keep you warm at night. No, the word comforter actually has two Latin roots, cum, which means with, and fortis, or fortify, one who comes with you to fortify, to strengthen. And I think that's an, a, a good translation of what's called helper here also. A person who, who is with you to, to strengthen and fortify you. And I mentioned in this, word, in this verse, another. I hope you underline that. Because Jesus says, another helper. Another in English is just one word. In the Greek, it's two words. Two words. 
uh, there are two different anothers in the Greek. One another is a generic another. It means another one. The other another is another of the same kind. So let me give you an example. If you have a flat tire and it can't be repaired, you go to the tire store and you might say in the first another, I need another tire. So you might get a Bridgestone or a Dunlap or a Goodyear tire. It's another tire. But if you go to the tire store and you say in the second another, I need another tire just like the one that is, is disabled. I need a Michelin a, a Pilot MS 24560R19Y. That's the second another. It's another of the same kind as the one I'm replacing. That's the another that's in your Bible in verse 16. It's another of the same kind. So when Jesus says, I'll send you another helper, he's telling the disciples, not just generically a helper, I'll send you a helper just like me, God. If you move down to verse 26, same chapter, Jesus says the, te- the Holy Spirit will, will be a teacher. But the helper or the comforter or the counselor, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. So I want you to underline teach and then and bring to your remembrance. I want you to underline remembrance. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Go back to verse 17 just for a minute. In verse 17, Jesus tells the, the disciples that... that uh, uh, even the spirit of truth. So he calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus told one of the disciples, when they asked him the way to where he was going, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Now, he wasn't talking about truth axiomatically. He was talking about truth as it relates to salvation, sin, condition, uh, a relationship people have with God. So in verse 17, when Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of truth, he's saying the Holy Spirit is the source of the same truth that I am. The Holy Spirit is the source of the same truth about salvation, about sin, about relationship to the Father as I am. Now note back in in verse 26, excuse me, I, I said, underline remembrance, bring to your remembrance. So the Holy Spirit will not only teach these men, he will bring to their remembrance. Now you could ask, remember what? Good question. Keep in mind that these 11 men will primarily be responsible for writing the New Testament. Writing the New Testament 30 to 60 years after this scene in the upper room So it's important that the Holy Spirit brings to their remembrance the words of Jesus as they write the New Testament. You may make a note here in your Bible under remembrance. You may make a note, 2 Peter 1.21. Peter, about 40 years later, 45 years later, says, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were moved along. Finish it for me now. Men spoke from God as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. That's the remembrance that was necessary, that the Holy Spirit worked in these men's lives to produce the New Testament, that they would remember what Jesus had said. Beginning in verse 25, Jesus uh, takes a pause for review. So in verse 25 and 26, Jesus says, I'm leaving, but my peace is staying. I'm leaving, my peace is staying. His departure is temporary. Temporary because another, but the same God, alas parakletos, same helper, is coming for their good. Jesus is leaving. In verse, verse 27, he bequeathed them a large inheritance, a large inheritance, his Holy Spirit and his peace. That's what he, he leaves with him. All of this hinges on their understanding of God. 
I'm God, Jesus says. The Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. We're all God, three in one. The Holy Spirit is as much God as the Father is. Look, let's continue. Look at verse 28 of this chapter. And this is an important verse because uh, many of the cults use this verse to say, see, Jesus is not God, or Jesus is a junior God, or Jesus is only inspired by God, but not God. As you, as you talk to unbelievers, as you talk to unbelievers, the largest hurdle for them to get over is the deity of Jesus. Yes, he was a good teacher. Was he God? No. That's, that's a difficulty. And so cults use this verse to say, see, he's not God. Jesus says, I'm going away. I'll come to you. That's in the form of the Holy Spirit. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And those cults say, see, he's not the same as the Father. He's junior God. Again, the context and the grammar is so important here. The Father is greater in his glory, yes, compared with the humanity of Jesus. So in that sense, yes, the Father is greater than Jesus. The second chapter of Philippians, Paul tells us that Jesus set aside some of his deity to become man. So in that respect, the Father in full deity is greater than Jesus who set aside some of his deity. We know for sure that he set aside two things. First of all, he set aside some of his glory, Philippians tells us. What is that? He set aside some of his worth, some of his radiance, some of his mass. He set that aside. He gave that up to become a man. Secondly, we know he gave up, he gave up some of his omniscience. Recall in the Gospels, the disciples ask him on, on a number of occasions, is it now you're going to set up your kingdom? Remember what he says? He says, not even the angels know, only my Father in heaven knows. Jesus gave up some of that omniscience when he became human. In, in support of that, if you look at the 17th chapter of John, in, in John 17, uh, theologians call this the high priestly prayer because Jesus is intervening for not only his disciples, but he says, I'm intervening, I'm praying for those believers who come after them. Jesus is praying to the Father. Listen to what he says in the fifth verse of chapter 17 as he prays hours before his crucifixion. Verse 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the earth existed. Again, he gave up some of that glory the glory I had with you, I'm, I'm coming back for it, Father. So verse 28 is not Jesus a lesser God. It's Jesus taking on human form and not having the same glory and omniscience as the Father. Now, yes, fully human, fully God. He has less deity than the Father, but he's going to get it back, all of it. Let's look at verse 30 of this chapter. The disciples heard Jesus was leaving and sending the Holy Spirit. The, the, the disciples were, were told by Jesus, I'm going to a place and you cannot follow me. Difficult. Recall when Jesus called disciples, he called them from, from uh, uh, occupations as fishermen and, and other occupations. Remember what he told them? In his calling, he said, follow me. Now he's telling them, you cannot follow me. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a difficult transition for these disciples. Here's another thing that Jesus points out. They're still not grasping. They're still not grasping the connection between sin and his death. Look at verse 30. I'll no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. Who, who's the ruler of the world? Satan. He has no claim on me. Satan's power, sin and death, will have no grip on Jesus. He breaks it. Like he's, he's again trying to point out that, that his death is, is connected with, with sin and death. But he breaks that power. Satan does not control that. I want to pull together 
three thoughts from what we've seen in the person and work of the Holy Spirit. You're going to need to stay with me on this and listen carefully because I want you to choose one of three options that I give to you. I want you to make one of these three your own this week, to think through it at least once a day. I'm going to give you three. I want you to pick one for your own, and they're not given in any order of significance. The first thought that comes out of these verses have you ever prayed in the past, Lord, have, uh, I, I want more of the, of the Holy Spirit. I want more of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person who comes to you at the time of salvation when you, when you acknowledge your sin and accept the, the forgiveness that Jesus brings. He comes to you. He doesn't come to you in part. He doesn't come with just a hand or a leg. The whole person comes to you at the time of salvation. So in option number one, I want you to, to each day to, to, to commit to saying, Holy Spirit, I don't need more of you. I want you to have more of me. Every day this week, if you make that your choice, Holy Spirit, I want you to have more of me. The second thought, the second choice that you might take the Holy Spirit is given to teach believers. Recall that, that Jesus said he'll, he'll teach you and, call, and bring to remembrance all that I've said. But the Holy Spirit can't teach a person who doesn't actively desire to know what Jesus said. So if you pick number two, pledge this week every day to learn from the Bible what Jesus said. If you're new to the Bible, pick the book of Mark, the gospel that Mark writes. If you're familiar with the Bible, pick the gospel that John writes. And learn every day, commit every day to learn something of what Jesus said. So the Holy Spirit may teach you from that. The third thought I want to leave you, the third option you might pick to make yours this week. The peace Jesus gives is not an untroubled heart. Jesus did not come to earth to take away all of your anxiety. He didn't come to earth to make you calm on the inside. The peace Jesus gives is, is salvation. It is salvation, the forgiveness of your sins, the acceptance of God's sacrifice that gives rise to the untroubled heart. It's not an untroubled heart as a goal in and of itself. It's, it's salvation and, and peace with God that gives you that untroubled heart. So if you pick number three, if you're not a believer, choose this one. If you're not a believer, choose this. And this week, enter into a living relationship with Jesus and find peace. Confess your sin and grasp his forgiveness. This week, make that your goal to find that peace that comes from salvation. Let's ask, the God, let's ask God to bring these words to our, our remembrance as the Holy Spirit will work in your life. And I do encourage you to choose one of those three thoughts to make it your own this week. Join me in prayer. Gracious God, Almighty, Heavenly Father, we bow before you, you are God. We are grateful for your spirit in us that allows us to learn what you've said, to remember what you've said, to experience your presence inside of us all the time. Give us a desire to be people who want more of your spirit. To be people who want to learn what you taught. To be people, if we, if we are in the presence of an unbeliever here, to be a person who wants that peace, an untroubled heart that comes from God's salvation. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Amen.
just want to say thanks for joining us this morning. I want to say thanks to Jim uh, for teaching us. Growing up, the Holy Spirit is one of those conversations that can just be really difficult to grasp and to understand. Jim simplified it to three things that we want to send you out with. So do you want more of the, do you want more of the Spirit? Is that your prayer? Do you want more of Jesus' teaching? Do you want to learn and understand so it can transform your heart? Or do you want a relationship with Jesus? 
As you're watching online, there's people in the chats that want to help you process those three things right now. Stick around, ask some questions. Uh, they want to help you navigate that. So as we close out our service, just may the God of peace, who sent a helper, who's not subservient, who's equal, and shall I say better, who dwells within you, is here and is present. Open our eyes to it. God bless you. We'll see you next week.